by the time you, and you did. So let's talk about this fine lady, um, Helen Gauger. And I put down here, activist, suffragist, and advocate only because I would need a, probably an entire screen with all the other adjectives that describe what Helen did. Now, I'm gonna start actually more recently. In November, 2014, Chief Justice Loretta Rush, who's sitting standing over on the left here, shares the unveiling of the historical marker for Helen Gauger. Betty Nelson, who's with us here today, Betty, raise your hand, okay. Asked me about, uh, probably about five years ago, and I'm sure Betty, you don't remember this, said, why don't we have statuary honoring Helen Gauger? And as we're going to find out, I'll give you an answer to that by the end of our presentation here today, Betty. Okay, and don't let, don't let me get them, but this is, what, this is what has been uh, presented for her for that. And I think what's fitting is that um, during her remarks, uh, Chief Justice said, I, as Chief Justice, stand on Helen Gauger's shoulders. And it's very true. Helen cut a lot of paths for people who we have today. She helped to, she was part of a much larger group, as we'll see here, that actually changed our culture here in the United States forever. So who was this woman who basically was acknowledged as a bridge from the traditional roles of women in the 19th century to the rights achieved by women in the 20th century? Well, to understand her, we've got to kind of put her in a framework for what it was like when she was growing up and when she was becoming a professional woman and how Helen's behavior and her personality and her upbringing actually challenged the way things were, because if things were not challenged, things would not change. Now, Helen is a Michigander, okay? She grew up in a little place called Litchfield, which is in the southern, southern part of the, of the uh, state, right on the corner of Indiana and Ohio. And it was a farm, it was a working farm, uh, had seven children, there were all girls except for one boy. And you would think that this was kind of out in the middle of nowhere. In fact, if you drive through Hillsdale County, you do find yourself in farmland and it looks like it's in the middle of nowhere. But Helen's location was actually fortuitously or, uh, situated on the St. Joseph River and also on the Great Sauk, Tail, Sauk Trail that ran through there. And it allowed her to actually have communication with people who were going through, passing through on their way to other places. The Great Sauk Trail that ran through there was the major line for the natives that lived in that area that turned into the, the pioneers who used that as a trail. Part of it became what is called the North Territorial Road, which still exists today up there. Helen was educated at home and she was, and we, she was educated as we could probably surmise by her mother, especially, who instilled in her a lot of very strong principles. And she stayed in public schools till the age of 12. And then at the age of 14, she began college courses and nearby Hillsdale College. Now, Hillsdale College is kind of unique, and it still is today, it still exists today. The college's philosophy probably shaped Helen's perception of how the world works, and more importantly, how the world should work. The uh, Hillsdale College was founded actually as a free will Baptist school designed to actually educate Baptist ministers but they opened it up to the rest of the public because of their mission was the object of this institution is to furnish to all persons who wish irrespective of nation, color, or sex, a literary and scientific education. Now this was back in the early 1800s. This was unheard of as far as educational, higher educational institutions for the most part. Their founding principles is education is the headmistress of religion, liberty, and equality. And the founder's mission was to attack liquor traffic, opium use, slavery, and vice in uncompromising terms. Now, that latter point really fits with what we know of Helen's personality, which for Helen, it was up, down, yes, no, black, white, evil, good, and nothing in between. She was very pragmatic about her approaches to things and very convinced about uh, how the world, again, the world should be. So Hillsdale was the first college in Michigan to actually admit women on an equal priority with men and gave women an opportunity to study many majors, including the classics, but also to study science in a co-ed educational setting. But because it was a free Baptist college, it also had very strict conduct code. If you are a young lady, you could not go walking with a young man unless you got approval from the college president. Okay, fair enough trade. All right. Well, the early records of Hillsdale were destroyed in a 63 fire, so we don't have documentation that Helen actually graduated from Hillsdale, um, and she could have. She could have received a Bachelor of Science, but by uh, Helen's own accounting, 
She did attend Hillsdale from 57 to 59, but did not graduate. And the reason she didn't graduate is because her family contacted her and said, it is time for you to leave college and to go out and find a job. And part of the things we want you to do is we want you to send the money you learned from your job back so your younger sisters will also have the opportunity for an education. So with that in mind, the year before she received this kind of announcement, three of her uncles and her brother had moved to this little river town that was only 33 years old called Lafayette, Indiana. And since she already had family there, 1860, Helen packed her bags, got on a train, and made her way to Lafayette, Indiana. Now, Helen was all of barely 17 when she arrived here in Lafayette, Indiana. What was Lafayette, Indiana like in 1860? Well, actually, this is showing a map of 1868, and just to kind of get you oriented here, this is, of course, the Wabash Erie Canal right here. <laughs> Uh, we are sitting right here. Where you are, we're right here on the map, okay? Because that's uh, Columbia Street, that's uh, South Street there. This is 9th Street going right up here, and there's State Street. So it was a present there in 1868 because that was where all the really rich people lived, okay? Anyway, in 1860, Lafayette was rough and tough, smelly. Part of it because of this ditch that is through here, the Wabash Erie Canal, which was still functional at this point, but also because of another structure that I can see right here. This is the Pearl River that ran through the southern part of town, which was basically an open sewer, okay? And so it gave a certain fragrance to the air in Lafayette, Indiana. But it was brawling. It was pretty much whiskey making, drunk and drinking. Uh, politics arguing, a mix of Irish, German, and, and English, river town. Okay, that's what it was in 1860 when Helen got off the train or the, or the stagecoach or whatever she was that she actually got into town. Um, population, 12,000. Okay, now Lafayette at this point was up and coming because it was a center of commerce. We had the river, we had the canal, and we had at that point, by that point, three railroads with two more coming in. So Lafayette actually was becoming Star City, the center of the area. Now, the thing is that, okay, as all small towns get going, they tend to make a few stumbles. And one of the big things that Lafayette citizens could not decide on was how to tax themselves. And so they had a lot of debates. And in the process of debating, somebody forgot to collect the taxes for a few years. And because of that, they couldn't keep the schools open because they couldn't pay anybody because they forgot to collect the taxes, okay? Well, they got that apparently straightened out by 1860 and they have opened up the schools again and they needed teachers. And that was what allowed Helen to find a job and come to Lafayette, Indiana. Well, culture in Lafayette was not too different from the rest of the United States in that it dictated that women had few opportunities to work outside the home. In fact, if you go back and you look at the 18, uh, 1860 directory, you find that all those 100 pages are all of seven, count them, seven, uh, items listed in there that even mentioned women, six of which are milliners and one is a sewing machine agent. That was where you could find work. Now you could teach, you could teach and you could be a secretary, okay? But if you taught, you really weren't expected to teach anything but lower level courses. You could not teach in a college or a university. So during this quote unquote Victorian age in which Helen was emerging as a young woman, there was an unwritten social contact contract that existed primarily between middle class men and women. Not as much in the rural area, but again, it was kind of the standard for the country. This is what you saw in the quote unquote social media of the day was the picture of the ideal family and male and female relationships. The woman was a great civilizer who created order in the home in return for her husband's protection, financial security, and social status. Okay, well, this kind of harkens back to what later became known as the two spheres of life theory of looking at it. And really there were two kind of spheres, a public sphere and a private sphere. And this is much more noticeable in New England and the middle, middle classes in there. But it also was something that permeated the rest of the country. The public sphere was male dominated. It was about business, you earn money. The private sphere was the, the area for the, the woman, home. And this is where you displayed the products of your status. The woman was designed, the, the gentleman would bring home the money, the lady would purchase things and display their status in the home. That was kind of the arrangement. Men were more concerned with the success, women more with nurturing. And again, that's why, again, women found early work in things like nursing, Clara Barton's work, for example. 
Aggressive and competitive is how you characterize a successful man. Submissive and domestic, the domestic woman. Okay, rational or men. Piety and purity are the hallmarks of a successful woman in the private sphere. The man was the protector, the woman was to be protected. And of course, the worst case for man was to lose their manly honor. And the worst case for women was to become a fallen woman. Okay, so those were the rules that were kind of unwritten, but reinforced as we know today. Today, we have our own culture. There's certain things you do and you don't do. And we all know what those are. But I dare you to find it written down in any book. We just kind of know it. In this case, they just kind of knew it. And it was reinforced by the things around them. Note that this cultural norm was not purely the man's invention. It was actually a contract that was kind of bought into on both sides, male and female, into this uh, situation. For example, this is Cody's Ladies Book. And this was very popular. There were 150,000 of these that were circulated at any given time. It was printed in, in, uh, in Philadelphia. And it was written by a Mrs. Sarah J. Hale. Now, she published the book, but you notice the book's name is not Hale's Ladies Book. It's Cody's Ladies Book because, of course, it had to be published by a man, Louis Cody. Okay? So it was published, widely circulated, and again, it made some interesting comments that give us a little insight into what Helen may be experiencing when she entered Lafayette in 1860. The companion, according to this book, the companion of man should be thoroughly able to sympathize with him. Her intellect should be as well developed as his. We do not believe in the mental inequality of the sexes. We believe that men and women each have work to do for which they are specifically qualified. Their work is equally noble. Oh my goodness. This is the early phrases of what you're starting to see in the equality question that was starting to emerge at this point. And the problem was these sort of thoughts that some in some circles considered blasphemous. Okay, my goodness, a woman is equal to a man. All right. Was something that not only was there, but was reinforced by every time you opened a magazine or you read a newspaper. And these are just some examples with that. This is Pearl Silk, and of course, what it emphasizes a perfect woman has healthy skin, good complexion, soft, white, beautiful hands, okay? And of course, she was probably weak. You hear again, again one of the things, one of the talks I used to give was on old medicine. And you would believe there were a whole group of medicines for whatever ails you. And then there was a much larger group for quote unquote, women problems, okay? <laughs> They made a lot of money off of the quote unquote, the perceived weakness of women in society of that day. Beauty's charm, a pure complexion, okay? Uh, and then swooning was both acceptable and fashionable, okay? It was written about in the European um, journals and magazines. And of course, many American women wanted to emulate what was going on in Europe. And so swooning kind of caught on over here too, okay? So, but reinforcing these cultural norms was actually a bit of law. The law of coverture. Now, I've not heard of this. I had to do some research in this. But this is a very, very old English law that was common law. And when I say common law, common law is kind of law that is, if you will, common sense. It's not written in any statute. You won't find it written down in the law books. But it's a law that everyone, quote unquote, operates under just because everybody knows that that's the law. In fact, the only way common law really gets discussed or published is because someone will write a dissertation or a, um, a paper citing what the things that are going into a particular common law. Well, this common law of coveture was something that came to the United States from England. And it comes down to this. By marriage, the husband and wife are one person in law. Of course, that being the man, okay? The very being or legal existence of the woman is suspended during marriage. Now, interestingly enough, a single woman retained her individuality and the rights, but a married woman forfeited those rights when she became married by common law. Now, this thing is that married women, therefore, did not have property rights. They did not have contract rights. They did not control their own earnings, nor did they have voting rights. And women were not supposed to speak in public or work in a man's job. That was the public sphere. They were in the private sphere. Okay, they could teach, but not at a college or university, as we said. Well, this law of coverture was something that started to be challenged over here in America about 1820, 1830. Okay, and certain states started to actually create anti-coverture laws in their statutes to try to reverse some of this with it. 
But although cultural norms supported suppression of women, a movement had been slow and grow, growing slowly of uh, this law, starting with the law of coverture. Women had begun to gather in small groups to advocate against all human injustice. In the history of the United States and in most countries indeed, when it comes to human injustice or society in general, typically it is the female who is actually spearheading this, even if they are under quote unquote suppressed. Okay, but this, uh, small groups began talking about slavery. So slaver, slavery, uh, abolitionism, suffrage, right to vote. Okay, coverture, what we just talked about here. And this had a very practical aspect to it. Coverture, which of course said a woman could not own property, meant also in those states where you could only vote if you owned property, it also prevented them from voting. Okay, and then temperance. Want to eliminate alcohol, and the reason was not because alcohol was necessarily perceived as evil, even though it was. It was to decrease drunken husbands from beating their wives, because spousal abuse in that way was very common, and actually, unfortunately, part of the cultural norm at that time. Well, the issues surrounding abolition and women's rights were often intertwined. We often hear about this. We learn in school. We learn there was abolition, there was suffrage, there was temperance. They were actually, if you look at it, most of them were the same people who were advocating. It was part of the bigger picture of inequality or increasing the social being, social status, all individuals. In 1840, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott, two abolition delegates, so they were delegates actually chosen by their state of Massachusetts to attend the London World Anti-Slavery Convention with their husbands. Even though they were the chosen delegates, they were required to sit in the segregated women's section outside of the auditorium. Well, during that segregated meeting, uh, Katie and Lucretia put their heads together and said, we got to do something about this. And what they decided to do is actually hold a women's rights convention in America, talking about equal treatment. So in 19, 1848, they created the Seneca Falls Women's Rights Convention. And this marks probably the point at which most people point to as the beginning of suffrage and equal rights movement in the United States. So it was a turning point with Katie Stanton and Lucretia Mott. Now, interestingly enough, this is a, a drawing that was uh, put out in, uh, I believe back in Harper's uh, way back in the 1800s, showing what was going on within this convention. Of course, you have the one speaker in the middle here and the others basically in various stages of paying attention or not paying attention, et cetera. But this was actually, Mott and Stanton came up with what they called a Declaration of Sentiments, which sounds very similar to the Declaration of Independence, doesn't it? And indeed it was. It was modeled after it and asserted that women had rights to equality in politics, family, education, job, religion, and morals. There was no reason why men could get away with things that women could not. Well, the Declaration of Sentiments had 11 resolutions to it, and it was presented by Stanton, Mott, who's a Quaker preacher, by the way, and several of the Quaker members of Mott's circle. Now, why I bring this up is because, if you will recall from your history, the Quakers are very pro-abolition. They're strong abolitionists. And so as they entered into the mid part of the 18th, 1800s, they started to migrate not only with abolition, but started to pull in the equal rights idea into their beliefs and, and discussions. Okay, But you had this. And here's an interesting thing that happened. All 11 of these resolutions were passed unanimously, except for number nine, which demanded the right women to vote. In that case, Mott, who was a Quaker, Quaker preacher, debated against the right to vote. Now, why would she do that? The reason being is that she felt that suffrage was too radical an idea, and that if it went down, it might take abolition with it. And because they were Quakers and abolition was number one priority, they didn't want to do anything that might possibly jeopardize the success of the abolition movement. Now, Katie Stanton took quite the other. She passionately debated for the right to vote because her feeling was women deserve the right to vote. They deserve to be equal. Well, she wasn't necessarily, she wasn't anti-abolition. She just more firmly believed in suffrage. Frederick Douglass, interesting enough, was the one who persuaded the attendees to retain Ruffridge in Resolution 9, and it passed. Lucy Stone did not attend the Seneca Falls Conference, nor did another famous um, uh, suffragist and abolitionist, uh, uh, Stanton. 
uh, Susan B. Stanton. She did not attend this, this particular one, but Lucy had been around for a while. And she, had, she was a reformed, if you will, abolitionist, meaning she had actually, she said, I was a woman before I was an abolitionist. Therefore, I must speak for women. She started to make that transition from abolition to women's rights. And in 1850, she organized the first National Women's Rights Convention, which received international press coverage and started to make this issue of women's rights emerge into the public now, Lucy lectured widely, and in her 1852 speech, it said that she convinced abolitionist Susan B. Anthony, of course, you've seen her on the coin, to join the woman's rights cause, another abolitionist who pulled in the woman's rights cause and with it. In fact, Lucy actually spoke here in Lafayette in 1853. Meanwhile, back in Lafayette, young Helen was learning all about this in her progressive education at Hillsdale College and after she came to Lafayette as a school teacher and a college educated woman she kept up with the news most likely however in 1860 in Lafayette with predominantly white male citizens that ran everything okay it was more about temperance and control of whiskey than it was about women's rights because people kept making noise and might shut off the whiskey that was not going to go well in the Lafayette of 1860, the drunken, drinking, brawling Lafayette. Okay. And as the Civil War loomed and as the 60s came to 60 came to a close, the talk of women's suffrage was drowned out by the abolitionist view. The abolitionists were on the cusp, they saw, of being able to see abolition succeed, to actually rule out or to rule against slavery and support the Union. Now, Helen, when she arrived here, she did find other advocates with her. Uh, she attended the Second Presbyterian Church, which is still there, called the, now the Central Presbyterian Church. Uh, it was renamed in 1914. But the church culture supported her pro-temperance, abolitionist, and deeply religious values that she had. Not so much women's equality, okay, but the first three, okay, it checked all the boxes for her, and she found a group of people that she could relate to and, and work with. It was also at the Second Presbyterian that in 1861, the 18-year-old school marm met the 24-year-old newly minted lawyer, John Gauger. And they were married there on John's birthday in December of 1863. Now, Helen, in her own right, showed inklings of her greatness early on. She was a great teacher. In fact, she was promoted to be Lafayette's first woman principal. Okay, So she was successful in what she did. But within a year of becoming Helen Gauger, she quit teaching and she largely disappeared from the public record. We find no mention of her for a period of about six to eight years. During this time, though, apparently, according to her own account, she studied literature, music, studies, and learned how to practice law. Now, how did she do that? Interesting little twist of fate. Her husband suffered from an eye ailment that would put him bedridden and unable to read anything for weeks to months at a time. And so what she would do is she would read his law books to him, his legal briefs to him, handle all his lettering and correspondence and ran his law practice. And by doing so, he did, she accomplished what most lawyers of the day did in their schooling, which was to read the law. Now, of course, in her later years, she would say, but in spite of her knowledge in the 1860s, she could not become a lawyer because she could only be, in this is her words, only an errand boy. Okay, so a little bitterness there, perhaps, in uh, 1890 when she made that comment. So as we said, developing women's rights really got put on hold during the Civil War itself, and the dominant abolitionist movement actually kind of funneled women's efforts into supporting the Union, because again, victory of the Union would eliminate slavery. However, after the war, women's rights advocates expected both women and men abolitionists, since their cause had been succeeded, to join in the equal rights and suffrage movement. It didn't necessarily occur. But then came the 14th Amendment, okay? The 14th Amendment was put out first, proposed in 1865. And the idea behind it originally was to grant citizenship to all persons, all persons, not males, all persons, born or naturalized in the US, including formerly enslaved people. All persons born or naturalized in the United States are citizens of the United States. And no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. 
That's what the 14th Amendment said, section one. Where the problem was, was in section two. And everybody read section one and said, great, sounds good. Read section two, okay? Here's where the problem started. But when the right to vote in any election is denied to any male inhabitants of such state, the basis of representation will be reduced. Essentially what it was saying here is it was not illegal to deny votes to anyone. You could still do it. You would just be penalized by a decrease in representation in Congress. So if your particular state had 50% black males of the male population and you denied them vote, your representation in Congress would likewise be reduced by half. So it was a weird way. People always say, well, this basically gave them the right to vote. No, it really did not. It simply put out a ramification and representation for those states that denied votes of males. Females, by the way, were completely left out in section two. Nothing about women. Hey, women aren't voting? No problem. You can still have the same representation, okay? That was what was that. Well, after reading this, you can imagine that Stanton, Stone, and Anthony were just a little bit incensed, okay? And so they petitioned to actually have Congress remove the word male in section two and replace it with persons so it would be consistent with section one. Section one, remember, said all persons. And so they actually then decided we need to take greater action and get organized for this. And what they did is they put together a group called the American Right Equal Rights Association, and it consisted of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Elizabeth, Lucretia Mott, who of course started the Seneca Falls Convention, and joined by Lucy Stone and Susan B. Anthony. You've got the all-stars of suffrage and equal rights right there in those four people. In response to the pressure from the AERA and others, the House representatives actually did relent. And they went back and changed the wording in section two to persons instead of males, potentially opening the door for suffrage rights for women. However, the version failed to pass the Senate and the Senate would not budge. And so the final version that was uh, passed by the Senate in 1866 retained the word male in section two, shutting out women's possibility for gaining right to vote in the 1860s. So the appointment was ratified by the states in 1868. And then the 15th amendment came. And you'll recall the 15th amendment directly addressed the issue of voting but it focused on race and color, ignored gender. Rights of citizens to vote shall not be denied on the account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude, reads slavery. The abolitionists, of course, supported the 15th Amendment. So the abolitionists, the Quakers, that part of the women's movement strongly supported the 15th Amendment because it allowed blacks to vote. But members of the women's suffrage, some members felt that blacks and women, including black women, should receive the right to vote at the same time and firmly believed entrenched in those ideas. Well, this created a rift, unfortunately, between the women's uh, movement. And uh, we, because you had the radical women on one side and you had more conservative ones on the other. <clears throat> Lucy Stone was willing for black men to achieve suffrage first because her thinking was that she wanted to maintain close ties with the abolitionists because the abolitionists were strong, they're well organized. And she also wanted to maintain ties with the Republican Party that helped get abolition in place. Okay, So she strongly supported the 14th and 15th Amendment as a first step towards universal suffrage. In other words, the right to vote for all people. And her camp labeled the opposing camp as radical and racist, which probably didn't go over well, because the other camp was Katie Staten and Susan B. Anthony. Okay, And they, had, they were the quote unquote more radical sect because neither uh, 14th or 15th Amendment included gender or sex as a determinant for either equality or voting. So you can see that unfortunately our very strong unified front fractured under this particular thing. In fact, it went so far, there was a suffrage campaign in Kansas in 1869 that really, really, really got ugly. If you want to read about politics, read about this, okay? The suffrage movement in Kansas, because Lucy, Katie, and Susan B. Anthony were all involved in that. And by the end of it, it was so bad, they accused each other of basically uh, leaving the principles under which equality was founded. And so Lucy Stone, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony split 
and they formed their own association with competing magazines and journals. They were no longer working with each other. They were actually working against each other and splitting the effort between them. Meanwhile, back in Lafayette, okay, Helen was following all this because, again, she was a learned woman, a college-educated woman, and she was starting to probably get the feeling that she needed to re-engage in public life, have a say in this. Now, these folks that I just mentioned beforehand have been at this now for 20 years before Helen came on the scene, okay? Well, in 1866, Lafayette YMCA first opened. And it provided Helen with a quote unquote socially acceptable way by which she could talk with others about these issues of the day. Because remember, women in the private sphere are not supposed to talk about these things, right? But this actually gave them an avenue for being able to get together in groups and debate the issues among themselves as women of the day. And the why in the wise first year, Helen attended a speech by the famed Civil War nurse, Clara Barton. And Clara Barton became Helen's first female role model that showed her what a strong, vocal, intelligent woman could do to improve humanity. And that was something that carried Helen through her early years as, a, as an advocate. As the 15th men, Amendment debate continued amongst women's rights, the uh, Lafayette YWCA, YMCA, hosted a women's suffrage convention. So now they're talking about women's rights. It was attended by 200 interested citizens, which is not a small number. After a few days, one of their conference speakers spoke to the Lafayette Baptist Church congregation, advocated a home for the friendless. And this issue rang or resonated with Helen because this was something that she believed is that there were people suffering just beyond women who did not have the resources to actually live in society. And that was the idea behind the home for the friendless was a place for these people to go. And so Helen was inspired and became one of the founding members of the Lafayette Home Association, which was designed to do just that provide a place for people who had no other place to go. When Susan B. Anthony spoke in Lafayette YMCA in 1871 in suffrage, Helen actually helped organize the meeting. So she was now starting to step into the public arena. In 1871, the temperance movement was also gaining. So abolition was done, temperance was starting to pick up speed and it was like gaining support. And Helen joined it with fervor because she had a very personal uh, uh, event that made this something, made, uh, made her into an advocate. On a frigid day at the end of 1871, Helen went to pick up laundry from a woman who did laundry for her. And she found her dead with her four children crying next to her bed. And these are Helen's words. Standing beside the dead mother in a miserable hovel in the south end of the city, hearing the cries of their four orphaned little girls as they tried to cry mama back to life. And in the presence of a drunken father who had murdered this mother, by driving her from her bed into the storm before his drunken fury. We consecrated a life of ease to one of eternal war against the licensed curse, liquor, that makes such scenes possible. We would champion temperance work. Helen Gauger, this is in 1890, so this event that occurred back in 1871. Someone later reflecting on this turning point in her life where she adopted a stance against uh, drink adopted the temperance stance. She wrote, when I first became a temperance worker, I believed in praying away the evil because that's what she had learned to do through the church and through her college. But I became convinced the best way was to <clears throat> vote it away. <clears throat> After I investigated the matter of women's suffrage, I became a fanatic on both subjects, getting the vote and prohibition or temperance. And she saw those as inseparable. In spite of Helen's epiphany, it would take several years before she would actually publicly speak uh, as an advocate for suffrage, etc. In 1874, the one, Women's Christian, Christian Temperance Union was founded in Cleveland and actually developed an um, affiliate here in Lafayette. One of the earliest affiliates, and Helen Gallagher was one of the charter members of the WCTU because this, the idea that religion and the beliefs of, of Christian society drove these um, things forward was very strong in Helen. Still, still, through 1877, Helen did not speak out much. She attended a lot of revivals. She attended um, speeches, temperance speeches at the Grand Opera House, which is also called the Dreyfus House, Dreyfus Opera House, and the Methodist campgrounds out here at Battleground. Okay, she attended both of those pre-frequently and, and nationally. So she was learning a lot, but she still wasn't speaking until 1878. This was the turning point. 
She was actually, um, what she was invited to do is she was invited to speak with others at a temperance revival of 1,500 attendees crammed into the Lafayette Opera House. At this thing that she spoke at, she and the others on the dais convinced 300 attendees to come forward and take the temperance pledge and to wear the gold, the blue ribbon that indicated their acceptance of the temperance print. Shortly thereafter, in August 1878, she spoke at Clark Hill out here on the relationship between the church and temperance. And in the audience was a very important person. William Lingle was editor of the Lafayette Courier. And he wrote glowingly of her speech and of Helen, who created a profound impression. A quote, she was an independent thinker and quote, she fixed the audience attention. He just recognized something that Helen in herself had not yet discovered about herself that she could stand up and command the attention and deliver a message. Well, in addition to that, William Linger also maybe helped Helen because he created, allowed her to create a column in the journal newspaper called Bric-a-Brac and it debuted in November 2nd, 1878. In the long run, she would publish more than a hundred of these columns, each 3,000 words long, equivalent to several books. So Helen was not only speaking, but she is now starting to write. And she assumed a leadership role in the founding of the Parlor Club, a literary club that was founded with the object of attaining a higher, broader, and truer cultural, intellectual, social, and moral. Okay, sounds real nice. So was this a bunch of little biddies getting together and talking about things? No. Helen was elected secretary. But the president was E.E. E. White, president of Purdue University. And the vice president was Captain W.D. Wallace, DeWitt Wallace, who was attorney and supporter of Helen Gongar. Helen was now rubbing elbows with the right people. And by the way, this parlor club still exists. Okay. So insights into Helen started to emerge from her writings that she was doing. And kind of gives us an idea here into a little bit of her personality. Nothing is more difficult than to possess an independent spirit and at the same time, an amicable disposition. Now, it's interesting that in Helen's writings, what you see as a, as a thread is that she was, she was a hard lady, okay? In fact, it was stated at the end of her life is that she did not really have very many friends. She had thousands of followers and thousands and hundreds of people who worked with her, but very, very few friends who were personal friends. The first thing a woman must do if she has ambition and opportunity to do anything else then wash dishes, tend babies, and gossip is to encase her sensitive nature in an alligator skin, metaphorically speaking. If the eating of the apple ever brought one curse upon woman greater than others, is the curse of this element of female nature called sensitiveness, which more justly should be named weakness. Helen was not one to suffer fools like, okay? She really had little patience for people who would beg off and not stand up and be counted. This sensitivity must give place to common sense, this cringing fear to ambition and justice. Till then, no woman can be a true friend to, of herself or her sex or the unjust. Like I said, Helen was pretty black and white, yes, no, up, down, evil, good, nothing in between. You knew where she stood. And you can see how that would actually probably raise the hackles. Indeed, it did, okay? Well, in 1879, Helen, on her own, just without telling anybody, decided she'd tour the county poor farm. And just to give you an idea, Harrison High School is right here, 500 North, Salisbury or 50 West. So it's still there. The farm, county farm is still there. Okay. So this was called the poor farm back then. And she wanted to see what it's like. So she described the condition in her column and said, poor unfortunates are confined in dark, ill-ventilated cells day after day with no occupation other than that of looking out upon the corridors without attendance or skillful medical knowledge. Wow. So she took a step further. It's not enough just to write. She took action. Using the law of knowledge she learned from John over the years, she prepared papers to have 19 men and 14 women transferred from the poor farm to the new state asylum in Indianapolis, which had modern medical facilities. Sounds like a good plan. That was good action, good intense. What was a poor, a poor farm? The poor farm was basically, it was literally a farm, 
and it's where they put people to work to raise crops and so forth to kind of make their way. There was a place to put kind of the people who would not be able to survive on their own. And the county paid for it. Okay. So it was it was a poorhouse. Yep. Yep. So the thing is that she, uh, after looking at these conditions, she said, we're going to try to get these people to a better place. Unfortunately, only 12 of the 33 were accepted to Indianapolis, but the county still had to pay for 33 transfers. Only 12 of them actually transferred. Well, 286 bucks may not sound like a lot today, but back then in the county coffers, it was a lot of money. And the Lafayette Times picked up on this, Lafayette Times not being a fan of Helen Gauger. And they said they attacked the, quote, ignorant somebody, unquote, who bungled the, by filing defective papers, quote, costing the county taxpayers for their mistake. Ellen shot back in an editorial. As I am the somebody, I am personally responsible for this act of, quote, ignorance, and I hold myself financially, legally, and intellectually accountable. Go, Helen. All right. She goes one step further. If the laws in Indiana are indeed defective, if the fees are indeed exorbitant, then being a woman, I am not responsible for such ignorant legislation as no woman has a voice as yet in making such stupid laws. I put the stupid, but you know, you can hear that what you're saying. So in 1880s, uh, Helen speaking engagements about suffrage and strong women's rights really took off with the help of the WCTU that actually uh, publicized her nationally. And she got invites from all across the country to talk on these issues. Uh, her friend, attorney DeWitt Wallace from the Parlor Club and Second Presbyterian also supported and promoted Helen and, and publicly would state, this is our first lady journalist and lecturer which our city has produced. That summer, Helen joins Susan B. Anthony, one of her heroes, in addressing the National Women's Suffrage Association annual meeting in Indianapolis. And two months later, Helen herself organized the first large equal suffrage convention in Lafayette with Miss Anthony as a speaker. Helen was starting to get traction. So it was on to the state house. Helen and other state leaders lobbied hard for voting and for prohibition legislation. In 1881, the state legislature passed amendments to the state constitution for women's suffrage and prohibition. Okay, something's not adding up here. 1881, prohibition, suffrage being passed. Oh, there's a, there's a catch. By law, for a state constitutional amendment to take effect, the legislature had to pass the same changes again in the next legislative session, so in 1883, and then it had to be voted on by the public. That meant that the Republican majority in power in 1881 had to be retained in 1883 in order for the assembly to probably pass this legislation a second time. So Helen, doing what she did, ratcheted up her speeches and campaign. She stopped her bric-a-brac column and purchased a newspaper that she renamed the Our Herald that advocated for temperance, women's rights, social reforms, and was a platform for her to try, try to promote the re-election of Republican politicians. Her friend, DeWalt Wallace, was a Republican candidate for state senator from Tippecan County. She was he was close to, to Helen, you know, he was an advocate for her. He supported her and he basically pledged that he would uh, put in the planks, he would support the planks for the change in the amendments in 83 once he was elected. Well, because Helen was starting to get a little visibility now, she was starting to get some pushback. And unfortunately, DeWitt Wallace was brutally belittled by those against temperance and suffrage as hiding behind Helen's petticoats. Paid liars, toured the Tippecanoe County saloons, talking down Wallace and Helen with gossip and bar talk. So they'd buy a few drinks, get people liquored up, and start trash talking Helen Gallagher and DeWitt Wallace. Well, unfortunately, in November 82, the Whiskey Democrats won, okay? And they celebrated by a parade outside Helen's home carrying a big cartoon that depicted DeWitt Wallace with a foot of justice on his throat and a partially nude picture of Helen Gallagher. Okay. Class act. All right. So <clears throat> now the thing is, Helen may have inadvertently kind of brought this loss on herself a little bit because you see, 
in the summer of 82, prior to the election, she won a four-year battle to ban licensing beer and gambling at the county fair. She had been fighting this for four years, and in the summer of 82, she won. What she did, she garnered 5,000 pledges of people who said they were going to boycott the fair. And at 50 cents an admission, that amounted to $2,500, which was a small fortune for the county fair. And they said, okay, we're going to ban liquor, I guess. Okay, which they did. Now, one game booth at the 1882 fair had one of those games where you have the canvas bag and you take the ball and you throw it. Well, one of the figures had a likeness to Helen Gounder on it. And a little phrase, the lady who caused the fair to be dry. <laughs> and apparently it was one of the most popular canvas dolls that was knocked down in the fair fair. So Hell's increased visibility came with increasingly strong vocal opposition. Well, two weeks after that disastrous election, 1882, a rumor floated. It was seen that Helen was seen visiting Wallace's, uh, DeWitt Wallace's law office and staying till nearly midnight, something that was just unheard of. Well, it was all, wasn't true, but furious, DeWitt Wallace, who was an attorney, later a judge in the community, traced the rumor down to police chief Henry Mandler and a downtown barber named Charles Pook. <laughs> a barber, imagine that. Who spreads gossip? <laughs> okay, <laughs> a barber? Oh, they know everything's going on. Interestingly, Indiana law stated that a man could not sue another man for slander, but a woman could. So, Helen filed a $10,000 suit against Mandler and Pook for damages due to slander. It was highly publicized and it was a vicious trial that lasted 12 weeks, ending in April of 1883. The outcome, Helen got $5,000. Bad news, she never saw the money paid. And the strain of the trial literally turned 40 year old Helen's hair from blonde to white. Meanwhile, the 1883 legislative session, of course, now had the whiskey Democrats in charge and the failed to pass the second vote on the proposed suffrage amendment, therefore it did not become law. But Helen kept up her lecturing. She was now making up to, 18, up to $100 per appearance and doing multiple appearances a day. It was too much to have her speaking and her schedule to maintain the newspaper, so Helen sold it to a larger newspaper in Chicago called the Interocean. And what it did is it allowed Helen to some of her messages to actually reach a higher, broader audience and people who were more upscale. So Helen and John, this is showing inside their house at uh, 10th and Columbia, okay, uh, were financially comfortable between John's law practice and Helen's lecture income. In fact, Helen was making more money than John was. And John was actually investing Helen's money into stock, land ventures, and zinc mineral rights in Missouri. And she became actually, Helen Gallagher became one of, quote, America's greatest women money makers by the end of 1892. She was loaded, okay? And beginning 1886, <clears throat> Helen decided to take some of that hard earned money and she started traveling overseas. But what she would do is she would learn about the social ills in the country she visited. And then she'd return with that information and incorporate it into her speeches here in the United States for suffrage, temperance, and equality. Feeling refreshed, Helen was uh, promptly elected president of Tippecanoe County Women's Christian Temperance Union, a WCTU, which she had helped found in 1874. Now, let's stop for a moment. We're up to 1887 here. It's been 39 years since Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton held the Seneca Falls Convention, started this whole thing. 87 to 48, 39 years, almost approaching 40 years of doing this. Stanton's now 72. Mott's dead, okay? Susan B. Anthony is now 67, and Lucy Stone is now 69. See the problem here? Well, part of this was that at 44, Helen Gallagher was now the principal suffrage torchbearer in the second relay leg of advocates who eventually get to the right to vote 72 years after the Seneca Falls Convention. It was pretty much on Helen's shoulders at this point to kind of move things forward. So in 1887, Helen was reelected president of the Indiana Women's Suffrage Association, and she entertained the aging Susan B. Anthony at her home at 10th and Columbia. We should never understand, uh, misunderstand, underestimate, excuse me, the impact that Helen Gogger and Elvis and her advocacy had even at the highest levels of government. Now this guy, all right, President Benjamin Harrison, who Helen had openly and vehemently campaigned against in 1888. She wanted to have, quote, nothing to do with that son of a bitch who's your son. 
I'm not certain that was actually totally written down, but that's what she said, she said. Okay. <laughs> anyway, as is the case, the president was appointing postmasters and he was trying to consider who he would appoint for Lafayette postmaster. His preferred candidate was Nate Craigmail, who was a saloon keeper in Lafayette. If I were to appoint him, unless she could be silenced in some way, there's a little lady in Lafayette who could turn that appointment into a club and use it with terrible force over the head of the entire Republican Party. Harrison knew all about Helen Garber. Okay. After some consideration, he changed his mind and decided he'd probably go a different direction and appoint Reverend Wilson Smith, a Methodist minister for the post. Well, good, that ought to assuage Helen with her religious tendencies. Uh, not quite. You see, Reverend Smith's choice angered the current congressional representative in Lafayette, who was a backer of Craig Mile, and who, along with Helen, identified that very same reverend as one of the rowdy post-1882 election revelers with the huge cartoon of DeWitt and Helen partially nude. Okay? So he still got the appointment, but he didn't last long. Okay. Anyway, that notwithstanding, Helen charged forward and through the 1890s, her aggressive speaking, she supported the ever struggling prohibition party. She spoke before the legislature and she did at least 500 engagements, turning down the same number. She was so popular in such demand. In 1890, some of Helen suffrage leadership, however, shifted back from her shoulders as the torchbearer to Elizabeth Cady, uh, Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and Lucy Stone, because Helen, Lucy Stone's daughter, Elizabeth Stanton's daughter, negotiated to get the two factions of the women's suffrage associations back together and reunified them. Unfortunately, reunifying the group, because again, most of these ladies were very old or starting to get very old at that point, made little progress in advancing the prohibition party or the suffrage movement. And in 1892, we're closing in on the end of the century, Harrison's Republicans beat Cleveland's Democrats without either party having planks for suffrage or prohibition. What happened to the prohibition party Helen was behind? Well, in Tippecanoe County, Harrison got 48-56 votes. He beat out Cleveland, 43-68. And the prohibition party got uh, 208. Okay. So unfortunately, Helen was very, very strong in backing the prohibition party, but she was kind of backing the wrong horse, if you will. But she continued to ratchet up her rhetoric. And you've noticed some of the rhetoric I, I pointed out to you beforehand. It got a little stronger as she got older. You know, okay, those of us in the room who are a little of the wiser age know that we care less about what people think about what we say, right? <laughs> okay, well, Helen, who started at that level, as she got older, got a little bit stronger. In fact, in 1894, she wrote an article in which she called Susan B. Anthony a moral coward and a failure as an organizer because Anthony was advocating that no prohibitionist party member should take part in the women's suffrage campaign. And so Helen called her out ending that friendship. Okay, in 1894, Helen decided she's gonna to have to strike out on her own and directly challenge Indiana voting laws in the name of suffrage. So in 1894, she went down to vote in Tippecanoe County Courthouse and they said, no. Well, she did what any good lawyer would do. She sued him, okay? And she listed a lawsuit of equal, in the name of equal suffrage asking for $10,000 in damage. And again, today's money, that would be several million dollars, okay? From the Tippecanoe County Election Board who obviously did not have that kind of change. So the Tippecanoe County Superior Court judge set the hearing for January, 1895 to hear Helen's case. Now on that cold morning, Helen was sworn in as the first female member of the Tippecanoe County Bar. Indiana Bar wasn't even founded two years after that, but she was the first female member. And this newly minted member then went to the courtroom, sat at a table where there was yellow, yellow roses, the symbol of the women's suffrage movement, and she presented her argument in a carefully documented four-hour presentation. As she stated in here, the decision of this court will affect the liberty of one half of the citizens in every state in the union. And she believed it. At the conclusion, Judge Everett began a four month long process of due deliberations, conferences, and research that culminated in his April decision, which was he ruled in a 14 page decision that he could find no law that would give women the right to vote. 
the note of something. Helen's contention was not, does the law give me the right to vote? Her contention was, the right to vote is inherent. Is there a law, an Indiana law, that bans me voting? Well, the judge rejected her contention, her point, and said there is no law that supports women to vote. Well, Helen and her associates immediately appealed to the Indiana Supreme Court. And on February 19th, 1897, at the age of 54, Helen Gauger and her associates argued 63 points of constitutional law before the judges of the Indiana Supreme Court in an attempt to overturn the lower court's decision. It only took the high court five days to come back. And unfortunately, they rejected her appeal. This is a pretty big loss for Helen because she put everything into it. It was kind of a Hail Mary, okay, for what she wanted to do. But she kind of students her loss by traveling, finishing her home in 10th and Columbia into the beautiful structure it is today and lecturing about suffrage in her travels. And she also funded, kind of in this guise of, of trying to help society as a whole, the Rescue Mission for Reformation, Shelter, and Protection of Unfortunate and Misguided Girls, what we would call today a reform school. Unfortunately, it had very little backing financially. It closed a year later, but it sure reflected how Helen wanted to do more than just help women. She wanted to help all people in society. So Helen kept up her schedule through the end of the 19th century, but by 1899, John's health took a turn for the worse and she had to cut back. So instead of lecturing, what she was doing is she's writing magazines, articles, and editorials. She spoke in support of William Jennings Bryant, 1900 cap campaign, women's suffrage, imperialism, immigration, prohibition of alcohol and economic. And there were 12 other things on that list that she would speak about. You had a topic, she could give a speech, okay? So as in 20th century dawn, as Helen's getting a little bit older, younger women like Jane Adams and Mary Baker Eater were now fighting against political corruption and poor working conditions. This is the time when the uh, book by Upton Sinclair came out, The Jungle, et cetera, talking about working conditions. Those issues started to surface also and started to take some of the moment, momentum of women for reform into that camp also. In 1900, there's an interesting twist of karma that I threw in here. Remember that police chief that slandered uh, Helen and, and DeWitt in 1882? Well, he was publicly and soundly humiliatingly defeated in his attempt to become elected as town, township assessor, gaining only a half dozen number of votes. <laughs> now, you know, Helen was in her house with, we're no one because here, with a little bit of a smirk on her face when she got that news. Okay. So on June 6, 1907, Helen rose early, as was her custom, to start her day, but she suddenly became dizzy, fell to her knees, and she died there on the spot before John, or the housekeeper, could get her into bed. The funeral was held right there in her castle cottage two days later, and telegrams poured in from all across the country with loss and condolences. But the newspapers also carried her story, and here's important. It was not just about her fight for justice for suffrage, but her fight for equality, justice, and improved living, all citizens of the world. 13 years later, after her death, in 1920, the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution enacted, was enacted, granting women the right to vote. And from her eulogy, she was courageous and ever ready for battle. Indeed, her soul thrived on conflict. Epilogue notes, a couple notes to just kind of share with you. The last leg of that relay, I took you up through about the early 1900s with Helen's story, was every bit as difficult. In fact, suffrage got to be pretty violent over in Britain. Uh, that was the case where women would protest, they would actually break and bust up things. Uh, police would come in, club women, and drag them off to jail. It really got awful. Of course, there's also the story about the suffragette who stood out on the racetrack, racehorse track, and was run over yelling women's rights and equality, and they got run over by the lead horse and died. No woman from the 1848 Seneca Falls meeting lived to see the right of vote achieved in 1920. And in 1917, 1918, Indiana came close to passing partial suffrage laws. But in both cases, like we saw back in the 1880s, they failed to acquire the necessary votes to actually pass. So I had to wait for the national law in 1920. This is an interesting thing. This is something Lorraine and I found out. Although individual cantons in Switzerland granted women the right to vote starting in 1959, it wasn't until 1990 
that the entire Swiss country adopted a national suffrage law giving all women the right to vote. 1990, and you thought America was slow, okay? Today, Helen's Castle is, uh, Cottage Castle is the Fisher Funeral Home, again, it's right across from Argenbright, uh, down the block from that. You pass it every day when you go uh, down Columbia Street. It's been beautifully restored. If you knock on the door, sometimes they'll let you in if they're not busy. <laughs> okay, they are a funeral home, okay. Um, but we had, a, we had a tour of that, we had a meeting with their place on the inside, it's beautiful. And there are photographs that are actually on, online that you can see. I wanna thank uh, the late Bob Kriebel, uh, Deborah Cedars, Mary Antrup, Kevin Cullen, and others for compiling and sharing the story because really without their efforts, Helen would be lost to the ages. Now, Betty, you asked me why there was not a monument to Helen. And probably the best summed up by Bob Kriebel, who stated that it appears from Helen's interactions with Lafayette she neither cared for Lafayette nor Lafayette cared for her. Unfortunately, she had backed the Prohibition Party to the exclusion of the Democrats and the Republicans who were in power at the time that she died and when a monument would have been a natural thing to do. And that's why her story really is kind of lost through the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s until Bob Kriebel in the 80s, 70s started to resurrect the story and published the book that he did Called. Well, I've got a picture of it up here. Come on, Pete. Do the easy thing. All right. Where Saints Have Trod. It is available through Amazon, even though Amazon misspelled Bob Grable's name. Uh, okay. So, <laughs> but um, yeah, that's the book. And it's really interesting. It goes into much, believe it or not, I only gave you the top of the iceberg about what she did. It was so much about her in that, in that book. So anyway, thank you for your attention. And I hope you learned something that you didn't know when you first came in. Thank you. It's about the YMCA. Its early use was open to women and men. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. In fact, it, it kind of viewed itself as an ability for Christians to actually come in and actually discuss issues of the day in a Christian environment. That's really kind of one of its functions early on. And of course, one why YWCA might have been raising a little heckle. Why do we have to have an association for women <laughs> in the 18th century? So the women's, the Young Men's Christian Association was the first one that was formed, but it was inclusive for women and men. Good question. Yeah, very good. And when did the YW get here? You know, I don't know the answer to that. That's a really good question. Later. <laughs> That's as close as I can tell you. That's when it was. Yeah. All right. Very good. All right. Well, thank you for coming. We've got uh, we've got some other programs coming up yet this month. Uh, I'll be back in July talking about George Aid, one of my my, uh, my favorite uh, topics with that. And I will share some real juicy tidbits of gossip with you about good old George when we get back together in July. So, okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I don't even know who did it or anything. Well, it's not going to replace, I think. Yeah. Um, well, I'm so glad you. I'm so glad you. Back for another one. That sounds good. I wanted to introduce myself. I'm Cindy Twanger. You're, you're Larry Twanger's coffee buddy. Okay, got it. You're looked on our, on our table right now. That's the other thing is, I just said to Penny, I was the director of the YWCA for like years, and I heard that you were back today to answer that question. I retired in 06. I do know the building, the original building on 6th Street, was a gift to the YWCA. Helen was there some of the time, so the best I can do. Great program. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. Say hi to Larry. I will. Okay. He said, tell him that Larry and Lynn. Yep, yep. Yeah. <laughs> I was looking at the picture.
Yeah, but they were so intricate. It was quite amazing. I have it. I have read it in three uh, um, okay. But I I couldn't even try to stand this. There's a lot of native here, but I unfortunately have got a spill yeah, yeah. Uh, right. Right. Okay. Right. You know, read it. Would you give us one? I push you back to the stairs. Well, that was fascinating. I really did. I've been at the funeral. I think I was there. I was there. So I was saying, drop by. So, uh, I forgot to, I thought I saw the compilation in our letters. I mean, we had half an hour. She spoke to me, and then I have a bigger room in the letters, but I saw the smaller rooms for our family to use. Oh, that's good. The family doesn't matter to me. I haven't done it since I was born. Oh, it's great. You first have a good idea. Yeah, I have a good idea. I thought you said she was already coming. Well, she did, but I mean, I don't know she I'm going to steal your video. Oh, you never got. Yeah. Thank you. And I just ordered that hard book. Oh, you got hard back. Yes. So I have nothing like that. I don't know if my husband has anything like that. Oh, he knows all right. Probably. <laughs> He's actually reading about Native Americans. <laughs> I just ordered the book. So oh, good. The last one in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Lena and 